So as part two, let's take a look at how we can create our different brushes. The brush engine is actually the most impressive part of Paintstorm Studio. You also see I'm now on a different interface. I switched to my iPad because I need to have a pencil with pressure sensitivity. But before we go into creating the different brushes, there is something I would like to make you aware of. So in digital painting, we have all these different brushes and sizes, etc. we can create. But the problem is, how do we make sure that they match actually our real life tools? In real life, most of the time, what we use is maybe a graphite pencil, and then a Kugelschreiber or an English ball tip pen maybe the marker, the marker has the broad tip, then the fine tip, and if you have a tria, then you have an extra fine tip. Maybe we have some fine liners, 0 0.1, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, or one uh, millimeter uh, yeah, stroke thickness, maybe uh, a Sharpie or something. And they all have different characteristics, how much they bleed, for example, markers bleed more on normal Xerox paper than, for example, uh, a ball tip pen. So I found what really helps, and this is what we will end up with, instead of just making a tool, we actually make a tool also already with the correct size. So I have a ball tip pen that is nice and thick. And then I have a ball tip pen, for example, that is very thin and where it slightly has a texture and breaks off. So simulating kind of like the, the line quality you would have when we're just holding the pen at, a, at an angle and slightly scratch over the paper. Because different pressures also have different texture effects uh, and uh, instead of all the time going then into brushes and adjusting all these settings i think it's more economically to simply create your different pens including the sizes then you can switch between them and simply you don't have to care about the correct size for example because in general you want to work on uh, a page, let's say it's letter format, uh, so eight and a half by eleven or eleven by eight and a half. Um, ideally, one hundred fifty DPI or three hundred, so you can print the stuff really nice and crisp. And then when we uh, kind of like print it, the strokes we sketch digitally should also really match our real life tools. So how do we make sure that our the, our digital tools are matching our actual existing tools. So let me show you one very easy way. What we do is we take a sheet of paper and then we put some tools down like marker, uh, pencil, etc. And then we scan it in and we can use that then as a reference. So here I have one page where I did some tests, for example, a Kugelschreiber, pencil, colored pencil, Sharpie, a fine liner, uh, a Stedtler Mars brush, and then my Copic markers, also with different tips, a very single stroke, a very fast stroke, and for example, the strokes where I start going over one, two, three times. So I end up like with four layers to see how much, for example, the color saturates. This is very helpful. Uh, one side for establishing the correct size and obviously also to see the correct texture. Okay, so and then let's start with this first. I would like to create a new layer because I don't want to work on this layer by accident and erase it. Let's go to brushes. You see here we have different categories in my own category. Let's create a new category by clicking on the gear icon, new category. Then we can rename it. You can give it a name. And 
To the left of the trash can, there is this document icon with a bent corner. That's actually the icon you use to create a new uh, brush. But it's not really making a new brush, it's simply making a copy of the previous brush. So I went back to this uh, category here. And in case you changed the different brushes and played with them, we can click on the gearbox and then say reset, for example, just the current category. And then it will reset all the brushes in that category to the default settings. Main reason why I did this, this is a very basic brush. I can click it. So it's selected, go to my new category, click on the document icon, and you see then I can make one or two copies. So let's start with the Kugelschreiber. And shoot, <laughs> wah, wah. Uh, by accident I just deleted that category from there. Just wanted to rename it. So Kugelschreiber roughly translated sphere writer. Okay, good. So let's take a look at the really amazing part of Paintstorm, the brush engine. Let's actually collapse this. Then we can click actually on these tabs and then it uh, shrinks them. Let's start with brush form. So what we see here is first um, a preview of the way how the brush looks like, the blend mode, normal or multiply. The Kugelschreiber is, is adding actually kind of like a viscous paint, so it's more covering. So we can actually keep the blend mode to normal. It's not like watercolor where it blends. Then circle, that's fine. And here comes um, number one of the really amazing parts, and the graph. So what's the graph? In Photoshop or in other programs, you have a hardness or softness slider. So you can make a brush really hard or very soft, which is rather linear. And here we have a graph. So if, for example, I draw somewhere, you see that the edge, if I zoom in a little bit, is slightly soft. Okay. Let me show you what happens if maybe we select this linear transition. So you know the edge is already a lot softer. If maybe I go to something like this, it's even softer. So what's happening here? If you take a look at the graph, this point, I'm going to select the red one. The position where it is, is actually on the top and the left. The left part is the center of the brush and top means it is 100% opaque. So it covers perfectly. And then this point I selected, and that is at the end to the right. That's the edge of my, uh, my brush. And it's at the bottom, which means it's transparent. And then the graph, kind of like with this dot in between, we can define, do we have a linear? Do we have more a concave, convex transition? Is maybe, let's say, one half to the center is uh, opaque and then to the outside you have like one quarter where it starts to fall off. We can add more points by just simply clicking on a graph line. We can delete a point by clicking on the trash can, we can select a point, even turn on the handles if we would like to to adjust the the flow just with handles. Now this might actually look kind of interesting. Ooh, what's going on here? There. Let's try this one out and I think we will have a very solid center and then let's zoom in a little bit. Yeah, you can actually here see where it's solid and then where it starts to actually fade off. Okay, let's remove these parts there and just normal point there. Okay, so the Kugelschreiber is actually rather covering and it has maybe maybe a small soft edge. So this one can actually go really far to, to the right side. So just a little bit at the edge, 
there's a little bit of softness, kind of like this. Okay. So that's for the form. Let's take a look at the size. Here we have a slider for the size, but the slider has two options. It has a minimum and a maximum value. Just keep that in mind. And now with on the computer with Alt and Command on the Mac or on the iPad, I have an on-screen button. I can then adjust the size. And you see now if I zoom in a lot to the line which I drew with a lot of pressure, I can just click on it and then adjust the size till I have really kind of like the same width. Okay, but you notice when I, when I press not very hard, the line is actually very thin. And you see to the left of size, there is an arrow that points down. If you click this, you actually open the, the options for how these values are treated. So I'm in stroke size and currently I have to find that pen pressure will adjust it and then here I have a curve. So if I do not really press hard, you see actually that there's basically no line. If I press very hard, see that on the right side, the graph actually goes up. Let me show you this again. I barely touch it and now I start pressing harder and harder and harder and you see the line gets thicker. Let's actually flip this line. Let's go this way. So I don't really press hard and I get 100% of my stroke size and then when I start pressing the size actually shrinks. So now I start pressing. So you see it actually gets smaller. So the orientation of this graph is really important and again the left side is the center and the right side is the edge and then the top is always maximum volume, uh, uh, maximum value, and the bottom uh, area is like zero of whatever function you use. And in our case, here we use the uh, the size. But I don't really want to have to press a lot uh, and maintain exactly the same pressure with this pen because I kind of like want to use this to really nicely ink lines. So to make it nicer on my hands so I don't have to press a lot. Let's say we make like 20, 30 drawings and I also do not um, want to have a change in the size. I simply turn it off. Perfect. Okay, let's select everything and delete it. I have to adjust the color a little bit. So uh, let's go to there. Yeah, maybe like this. Okay. Here we have something called opacity, and that's pretty much making it transparent. With 100%, it makes it totally opaque. It's up to you then to how much you want to, to add to it. So maybe I, I keep it at that value. Okay. Then uh, we have transparency and color amount, um, blur and ex uh, extends color. I leave those out for the moment. My blur basically explains itself, but it will come back to this later. And then we have stabilizer. Stabilizer is actually a really interesting function. If I turn this to zero and I just draw, you see it draws pretty snappy and fast. Let me set this to 65. I don't know if you can actually notice the difference. It actually gets smoother. So it filters out kind of like unevenness in your handshaking. If I go to 68 and you see the curve is drawn really slower because the software uh, kind of like memorizes where I draw and then it smooths the stuff out. 
This is similar to the steady stroke in Sketchbook Pro and this is a very great function for people who don't have a tablet because then even with a mouse you can make a very nice and smooth curves which without this function is actually very very difficult. We also have a rope. Rope means you can kind of like pull the line and the sh smaller the the stabilizer value, the smaller the or the shorter the rope length, and the bigger the bigger the rope. Also, the higher the number, the harder it will be to draw really small corners because essentially you start uh, kind of like what happens here if you lose tension and then you get corners. So there we need something like this. There. But most times I find very small values like 40 or 50 are actually really, really good. You don't really need more and that, that is really sufficient for doing good curves. Um, just to show you, there's also a spring, which is kind of funny. It's maybe hard to see on the interface, but uh, it makes the thing a little bit uh, like, uh, like a spring, so it snaps. Okay, good. So let's set this to this value. I always have a little bit of stabili stabilizer turned on. So my, my curves are always nice and smooth. And then let's go to spacing and jitter. So this is a general function that applies to all tools. So when I draw something it's not really that I draw a line. I'm actually placing many dots and they're overlap. And through the overlapping, you start getting the feeling of that you actually drew a line. And with spacing, if we increase this, maybe to 20, you see there is the spacing. Scatter, we can also, well, scatter. So it looks like lots of blotches or so. And this can be very, very useful for a very particular function because when you take a look at the scan, the line does not look like it's perfectly straight. So you see here right now, this is maybe a little bit too much. So let's lower this. Uh, maybe not enough. Uh, better, still too much. So maybe ten. Yeah, no, well, this is this is not too bad. Here and there, something jumps out, and that actually gives starts giving you the look that the line is affected by the paper grain a little bit. Okay, so next one texture. So we can go use texture. So what does use texture actually mean? Well, if I start painting, you see there is actually now a texture inside my my stroke. And the way how this works is the texture is not applied to the pen. So when I draw this line and draw this line and draw this line and draw a line in between, you see that the pattern will actually match up. If you're inside a house and you have um, like a, a rolling brush to paint a wall, the unique texture of the brush when you roll over the wall will be put onto the wall. But this is not th the way how this works. Rather think about that this texture is kind of like defining a structure of the wall. And when you start painting over it, the paint will show the structure of the wall. So the texture never really moves. And this is kind of like the way how this works here. Then we have, uh, for example, strength and contrast. So with strength, I can, yeah, well, obviously lower the strength. And with contrast, 
I can then increase the contrast of that texture. So you see now if I press it very hard, you see the texture more and if I set contrast to zero and I press very hard, there is a little bit of texture but I'm actually covering up with the ink of that brush. We also have the ability to multiply or to subtract. So right now basically the texture is used to yeah, think about like a stencil. I'm only allowing the brush to, to put ink down at certain areas. Then we also have the ability to, for example, invert this brush. So now instead of just seeing the veins only, the veins are left alone. We can also play with the scale to make it bigger or make it, for example, very small. But you see there, one problem happens. You want not to get to a scale where it starts to look like a repetitive pattern inside your your texture. And currently this is only using the predefined texture that come with it. It's also obviously a soil one, so it doesn't really work well. Uh, we can use a different one and you can also import your, your own one. This is a little bit more seamless and you see this, for example, works better. Okay, uh, select everything and cut. So after having explained this a little bit, let's see how we can get the line simulated. And it actually is very close. Maybe the contrast can be a little bit lower or higher, or maybe the strength can be ticked there. Yeah, now we're getting very, very close. Perfect. So I would say this is actually perfect. So we can make a copy and then this one re rename. So Google Schreiber hatching. This is also the wrong icon actually. So double click on or just click on the, the brush icon gives you then the ability to assign a different tool. Uh, if you scroll up and down, you see there are uh, some different icons. We can even import your own icons if you want to. And uh, let's see which one will I select. Maybe, maybe this one that looks like a cool Schreiber. Okay, so the hatching one has to be much smaller. So I will zoom in where I have maybe some hatching lines. Perfect, and there. And then adjust the size. So maybe is it like a three or four? Uh, so probably a four, yeah. And subtract. Maybe the scale. Now I really want to start having holes actually in my stroke because that simulates the, um, the paper grain. The size is still too big, so I can set this maybe to a three. Yeah, that seems to get close. And it's a little bit too saturated because I barely scratched the paper with a little bit of pressure. So I can now actually lower the opacity. Uh, this is not, yeah, this is too much. There. Okay, um, I must have used a previous setting for the texture that is too much. So you see, you have to, to play around sometimes a little bit with the, the values till you kind of get the, the visual look you want. zoom out. 
One thing, talking about zoom in and zoom out, always try to, to take a look at your drawings from kind of like a further distance so you can see if these lines uh, you draw are from seen from a distance feeling the same way as actually our scans. And I would say this is maybe still a tick to uh, opaque, so maybe there. Uh, a little bit more. Maybe that I have to adjust the color here also a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Mm, take more. Take less. So you see, it takes a little bit of of time and practice till you get close. Okay. I would say now we also have our. Google Schreiber hatching. And you see the advantage now if you want to, to work, you can just switch to this one, you switch to this one. I want to, to add a little bit more of like strength to it. Then I want to hatch this area. It's so much faster than always adjusting the size and then playing with all the different settings. To make this tool actually a tick better. I forgot to point this out. Because we draw very fast and with light pressure chances are also high that for example as you can see here and there the stroke might actually break off. So far we maybe worked with the pen pressure or so but we can also to adjust this, uh, the size also work with the stroke speed. So if I draw very slow or very fast, you see then it's there. And um, that's not what I want. So let's uh, change the orientation. So maybe like this. So if I draw slow and I draw fast, then it actually flakes out. But it flakes out way too much. What I simply want is just a little bit of a change so maybe I do it maybe a little bit like this. Let's see. So if I draw slow, it's nice and thick. And if I draw faster, then it actually yeah breaks out. So I can draw normal and fast. And at the end, I accelerate my pen. And then the, the size gets smaller. So this can for example, also be very useful when maybe we would like to create a Sharpie. And you see there the line flakes off and then gets kind of yeah, thin and, and breaks off. So I will go to here, make a new copy in this category. And now I would like to actually create the look of the, the Sharpie which is very saturated. But it also has these kind of like maybe thicker stars you see there. And that's actually a really nice tool if you want to uh, write so that when you start writing, the based on how quickly you write the individual letters, the, the start and end of your strokes will look a little bit different. And then we will mainly work now with, for example, the speed. So pressure we turn off, uh, stroke speed we turn on. For the moment, let's simply invert this. Okay, uh, size, well, obviously way too big. Zip, make this smaller. And then there you see if I draw really fast, the center part breaks off. So let's say here I will write Sharpie. Let's take a look. Uh, not too much because I I have a rather very linear progression. So here let's let's make it this way. There. Okay. So let's write this again. Uh, 
Ah, see, much better. So obviously speed is really key. If I draw this really slow, then yeah, because I get the same thickness because of the speed. But if I draw it quicker or make a variation, my stroke size has a variation. That's a really nice, nice look actually. Also, you see when I when I start to draw, go to somewhere and stop. Then this way I get kind of like this bleed effect. It is, however, very difficult to simulate something like this where you have a perfect circle and then just uh, the thickness. If we want to have a continuous thickness um, here with this one, we can adjust the thickness, obviously. So on the right side, that's really important. And then maybe here, maybe let's see, try to help this a little bit. Uh, because I have kind of like this effect here, it's not working really well. So let's remove this. Yeah, see, it is, it is a little bit tricky. Maybe one more try. We make this part where it's thick actually rather small there. Uh, no, actually, that's not too bad. The The end is, is difficult. Your start point sometimes can work well, as you can see here in this case. But then at the end, you you might maybe, I hope you can see this, it looks like a really thin line and then it gets kinder thicker instead of looking actually more like something like this. Kind of like there you can see that. So it's up to you how you want to, to do this. Drawing with speed here is really key. Also the variation between how much it bleeds and how much you draw the lines is a little bit too stark. So I will simply pull this line up a little bit more there. Let's take a look. Uh, actually, I like this, the effect first, uh, well, the first effect more. So maybe bring it back to there. Okay. Yeah, not too bad. So you see, just with the, speed function, we can then affect how, for example, um, a line starts and how it ends. So the Sharpie also has a little bit of kind of like a texture flake off. So we need to go to texture. I will go back to this one here. Let's take a look. And the Sharpie is also a pretty covering pen. So maybe let's increase the opacity. Yeah, okay. So let's try to, to get the size correct. So a little bit bigger. So it looks like maybe a seven or so. Yeah. Mm, this may be a tick lower. There should be something in it, but not too much. You can see here in my stroke, the grain is too strong in the scan. There is just a little bit of grain noticeable, but not too much. And maybe because this bleeds a tick, this has to be a, a little bit softer. So I change the graph for the circle shape. Yeah, no, and there you start seeing that the edge softness starts to get 
close. Yeah, perfect. So there is our Sharpie. So you see, it's basically very similar to the Kugelschreiber, just a different variation of how we can work with the different values. And then also there, you can make two different types um, for hatching, like a, one that's very thin and for thicker lines or slower drawing, thicker thickness. I honestly use a Sharpie most of the time simply for writing annotations, etc. And I, I really like this this look of start and end dots. So I do not really do hatchings with the Sharpie. Then there I simply would use my Kugelschreiber hatching brush. If I take a look at the Stettler fine liner, you see one characteristic difference to the Sharpie. It hardly has these bleed dots because it is ink and less a gel like the Kugelschreiber. It is a little bit more transparent or translucent, but actually otherwise it pretty much nearly seems to work the, the same way. So it's not really making any sense to cre recreate that type of a fine liner because honestly, I could do the same, for example, with my Kugelschreiber. It's another very good uh, thing to do. Take your different tools, make some lines, scan them in and then compare. Maybe don't even write down what tool is what and see if you can actually uh, realize or notice what type of a tool it is. Okay, let's go to the pencil. You see the pencil is very similar to actually the, uh, the Kugelschreiber. It simply is maybe a little bit wider. So here less pressure and, uh, but the stroke is a, is a tick wider because of the size of the pen. And the structure seems to be a little bit stronger while the Kugelschreiber has a more defined edge, the pencil, not really. So, to, to get the pencil done, it's pretty much a variation of the Kugelschreiber hatching just with a lower amount of opacity. But what's really interesting is the, um, if we take a pencil and then rotate it so we can draw with the broad side. And you see here, I, I did this actually with a graphite pencil and just went over the paper. So you start seeing the grain of the paper, kind of like this cloud structure. And then on the left side, I applied more pressure. So I gained more saturation. And what's important to notice is the more actually I went over the left part of the page with more pressure, the grain still maintained to be the same structure. And I didn't even cover it up. So definitely this is something where we have to work with the subtraction tool. But to get this shape right, we cannot use our circular form anymore. We now have to use a custom form. So I'll click custom form and we can click on this element here. And you see that I imported different shapes. And these are just scans of um, a marker. I just pressed it on the page and then scanned it in, cropped it into a rectangular shape. And then via the import new form, you can import a square like texture. And that then can be used for, um, yeah, um, as a shape. So in our case, let's maybe select this one, click OK, single form. And when I now draw, or draw left and right or up and down, you will see actually that the size is different. Okay, so this um, I have 
a change in the size. So this actually I want to turn off. So let's take a look. So not much pressure, exactly the same. Okay. By the way, this nearly looks like a marker at the moment. Then let's go to texture. Let's see, do we maybe have somewhere something that could work? What about maybe something like this? Okay, um, let's see. So I have to increase the size. Yeah, okay. I'm just making a copy of this one for later because this is already a good base for the marker. I said we need to turn on subtract. So and then let's play actually with the different values. So I need to increase opacity. And now uh, looks like this type of a uh, structure is not very good. What about this one? Maybe the scale can be played with. So you have to see this is too too dot like. Uh, doesn't really do it. What about this one? Now oh, this actually really looks like a canvas. So the trick here will be to to find a structure that is quite similar to what you need. It's also a good practice to maybe play around with them a little bit. The nice thing, but also the daunting aspect about this endeavor is there are really many ways how we can get to the same result. Essentially what I want is a nice covering. So I need to make sure that my my brush is big enough. I'm not really pressing very hard because if I press hard I put a lot of graphite down so I need something soft. Because I work less with opacity I can switch it to multiply so I see the stroke better and then maybe I can play with the scale a little bit to see if I can get something that can look similar to paper structure. Well, maybe uh, like this, well, but like 900. Yeah. Okay, so what if now I adjust the contrast so it's not so strong? What say we set this to to zero? No, it's not too much. Yeah. There, yeah. Okay, so maybe I go set this even down a little bit more, and you see if. No, this is still too much, so maybe five. Well, okay, see, that starts to look good. I mean, it's very difficult with the textures that which are built in or what you can find online to exactly get the same paper structure. You want to get something that, that looks close, but again, we will later see something from a distance and their differences kind of like fade away and there you can see that this actually looks already pretty convincing. Feels to me opacity has to go down even a tick more. Okay, but now I have to draw like crazy to get a good saturation. So in this case now I might have to actually turn on pressure. Uh, let's see, I do this maybe linear, okay, okay, uh, maybe six. So now I have to see if I press really soft, how much do I see if I press very hard? Oh, wah, wah. this has to be flipped. And there. Yeah, that's what I need. So very gentle touching, puts a little bit stuff down. And then when I press harder, there I get actually the look I want. Yeah, there is actually now our 
graphite pen. Or I could maybe call this one pencil, make it white. There. Perfect. Okay, great. So let's go to the copy I made of that and turn that into the marker. So the marker has one particular option because markers are fluid based. So water based, if you want to say it this way, or watercolor like, which means the more we draw over something, the more it starts to saturate. You see here one, two, three, four, which is like one coat, two coats, three coats, four coats. And then with four coats, actually, you reach maximum saturation. So you always start with a very bright color if you want to coat something well, because when you go over with the marker multiple times, you will saturate it and darken it a little bit more. And you don't really see it here, but if we, for example, put blue marker down and then go with yellow marker over it, where it overlaps, it will be green because it's uh, additive color. So it has to, the colors don't have to stack like crayons, they have to blend like watercolor. And we can turn this on when we go to brush form, blend mode and set this to multiply. Okay, let's give this theory actually a test. So there is some blue. Let's go to a nice yellow there, there is yellow and let's go over it and there it is green. Perfect. Also, if I put something down and go over and over and over and over, and you see it starts saturating it. How oh, fantastic. I zoom in. You also see there's a little bit of paper grain going on. So similar to what I have in the scan. So maybe let's go to here and draw this a little bit to see if if I can get something that looks close. Yeah. So the texture strength, if I really saturate it, for example, like here. So, oh, by the way, I forgot to say that. Um, just don't make a line down and while pressuring go over and over and over. You just add more to it. It doesn't really multiply because it's opacity 50%. So one stroke, touch the screen, lift your pen. Next stroke, touch the screen, brush, touch, and then release. And then this way you actually trigger the multiply, uh, multiply function. Because the multiply function only can work with a new stroke that goes over something below. Okay, so zip. Zip, 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 zip. Okay, let's compare. The grain is maybe a tick too strong. So what we can do, we go to texture and set the strength maybe to 74. And let's see how this looks. Yep, it's there. You can see that something is happening and maybe that's, that's enough. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and that actually looks looks like a pretty good marker stroke already. So the shape defines actually the the edge sharpness. But let's say you would like to adjust the rotation of it. So unfortunately, you can't see it, but my pen right now uh, is. I'm rotating it all the time, but you see I'm always drawing left and right. And if I draw up and down, it uses kind of like, well, basically exactly the shape up and down or left and right. But if I now draw at an angle, maybe I would like the, the marker to be rotated kind of like 45 degree in my hand. So this is not really what I get. So how do I do this? And for that, we can start working with the angle function. So let's say we just rotate this a little bit. Now you see now, this is actually rotated. So it looks like a 
calligraphy brush. And this is static. So you, um, doesn't matter how you hold the pen or what direction, it always uses this orientation. 360 means it just uses the brush. And if you pay attention to the brush preview, you can see how it slightly starts to slant. So kind of like 270 feels like, yeah, the, the marker is rotated. Now if I go vertical, I get a white stroke. And um, you can also see with the tool preview, it has no horizontal bar. That is actually defining the rotation of this texture. So along this linear line, the custom form is oriented. So now this line should be vertical. Oh, actually it doesn't show it to you there slightly at an angle. Okay. So that's a way how we, for example, can set up a calligraphy brush. Calligraphy brush, I mean. Thinking German, speaking English sometimes stresses me out. But maybe I want actually to have the ability for the stroke to rotate. So like in real life, if I draw along at a curve, I just move my hand, hold the pen still, and then the brush flows, like sweeps along that profile. And we can do this when we turn on the stroke direction. Click OK. And I go down and I rotate and I draw up and you see actually it simply follows it. There. So now I don't really have to deal with always rotating the pen. Simply based on the direction I draw, it just rotates it for me. And if I have to shade, uh, for example, along this arc, I just draw along and you see it rotates the pen for me. So pretty nice, very easy. There's also a possibility to work with pen direction. See now I'm, I'm actually rotating the pen. So based on how I hold the pen in my hand, it does the same. But what's cool about this is, um, let me select everything. So I'm, I have my pen rotated 45 degree and you see it draws this line 45 degree. And then if I continue holding the pen the same way and then draw upwards, it's kind of like a calligraphy brush. But based on how I hold my hand, I can adjust the rotation of the tool. So it's a little bit difficult to see at the screen recording. Just pay attention to how this line is rotated and there and if I want to to do an arc then I have to really rotate it nicely correctly but uh, as you can see here it can be a little bit tricky so I find actually the, the stroke direction to be very very useful can I even have some crazy things like pen pressure for the angle. So if I, pr if I press actually, I adjust the size, <laughs> sorry, not the size, the, the value for the rotation. Uh, it's kind of crazy what the program can do. Okay, good. So let's see what we have. So we covered actually how to make the, the markers. So here, stroke direction, this we turn off, okay. We have covered the texture. Uh, if you want to get this type of a brush, you have to adjust uh, the strength a little bit more. Something like this where it flakes off is kind of difficult really, to be honest, to do because um, this is very irregular and, and, and these types of shapes are hard and in general, maybe we we rather want to, to let it fade out. So instead of working with size, 
and getting smaller. In this case, now we work with opacity. So maybe I turn opacity on and we say speed, where's speed? Uh, there. And let's turn it to this and maybe maybe this. I'm just curious how this one will work. So if I draw down slow and then I fast, see, it breaks off. Because essentially the faster you draw, the less fluid can flow and the more the line actually will simply break up. Maybe a concave. Uh, draw really fast and if I draw rather slow then it's a continuous flow of ink. Okay, let's make this a convex. Slow and fast. Yeah. I don't like this too much. I rather will go, whoops go this way a little bit concave okay because markers are liquid based let me hide this here for the moment and let's go back to this color we have to also be mindful of the opacity so how much they blend the lower the opacity so 50 percent is what i have right now let's maybe lower this the less of the color you will see and the more i can add over it and currently you see that actually it feels more than more my poor marker is soon to expire it needs a refill another reason why copics are very good so 50 we have that let's go maybe to 75 it's very saturated so it's up to you to decide how, how strong you want to, to make these markers. And let's go to maybe a different color, maybe a little bit darker. Let's take a look how this one feels. Okay. See that actually now with that one, it, it has an interesting pattern problem you see the way how this works is it adds like one stroke to the next one dup, 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 dup. and that's uh, one of the little problems we have so if we for example adjust the spacing or fixation maybe make this a little bit smaller Oh, see no, oh, and they actually blend much better together. There, so you have to kind of play a little bit with the values, so you find something where the settings are just right, so you don't really see the individual strokes anymore, and then blends together. And if I zoom in here, you can still see even at the edges the different, uh, yeah strokes or shapes but again from a distance you don't really see it uh, look at this so beautiful this work maybe a stronger yellow there yeah awesome okay One little warning is the bigger the sizes, the small, uh, the the more sluggish sometimes something can become. Specifically when we have a lot of brush effects running, because the software has to do all these calculations at once, it can be quite overwhelming. Um, but also in Photoshop, for example, if you have an airbrush and you make the airbrush very big, so you go over three, four hundred pixels, it can get actually slower. 
So just keep that in mind. Sometimes you just you can't really draw super fast, just try to see what's the maximum drawing speed and just do it. And with the markers anyway, we want to have good control and then put the stuff down. Okay, I think that more or less covers everything about markers. How to make the smaller markers with these dots we know. That's basically the same tool like the Sharpie, but instead of having the normal mode, we have the multiply mode and we work with the opacity in a similar way. And then basically we have exactly the same uh, result. So the only brush that's kind of really missing is actually our airbrush. So let me quickly rename this one marker white. So how do we do an airbrush? Airbrush is a very difficult brush because we have to make a new brush and okay then it doesn't really have a change in the pressure for the size. Maybe we could actually adjust this later with the opacity. And then this actually has to be maybe set to this. The airbrush is pretty big. Here when we go to 800 or so, and I'm be aware. We're also drawing in a 300 DPI drawing, so it's a lot of pixels the program has to work with. And look at that, there's our airbrush. <laughs> See, it's actually the easiest brush. All you need to work with is a nice fall off curve from the center to the edge. And then based on how, how strong you want that to have an op opacity, you can make this lower so for example, we, we can cover parts still way too much. So maybe four there, yeah, no, this, is, this is getting good. Maybe when we go to 15 back, but no, instead of here having 100%, we just lower this a little bit. So that it doesn't really 100% cover at the center by default because I just want to put down nice shades. Yeah, and then based on how we define this, we can have different looks for it. Okay, and that's basically our airbrush. So, as I said, one of the hardest parts to do. And let's make a copy. Let's see if we maybe can add a little bit of uh, texture to it. See, that actually slows it down a lot. Uh, so, why texture? I'm just curious if maybe we can add some blotches or so to it. So it's not such a super clean airbrush. And um, I just made a noise pattern in Photoshop and blurred it and then imported it. And that actually I feel looks pretty nice. So you see there's, there's a little bit of structure or something happening. If I increase the size, let's see it. Ah, get a nice grain to it. The grain is maybe a little bit too too much, so it looks like the airbrush spits out a little bit of of dots. We can also maybe kind of like try to do it this way. We have a normal airbrush, so that's nice and soft, and then we just let's see if maybe if this works somewhere at some extra details to it just to, yeah, don't make it look so computer perfect. 
and you see even here that grain um, nicely helps. What happens if we turn subtract on? Oh yeah, our <laughs> our opacity is really low. Yeah, so then now with the subtract, you can see it really works like a more like a stencil actually. Okay, well, it's different different styles, but I feel like for an airbrush because it's liquid and it flows together, it's a little bit viscous. We rather can work with the the multiply there. One little tip, if you have to do very big strokes and it just gets too, too slow. And this case, what most programs do is we simply work with the spacing a little bit. So maybe let's, let's see if we have a spacing of one, do we see much spacing of three? Yeah, you have to be careful because with the spacing again, we, we add different dots. There we see that there is actually a structure. Now we can see this looks blotchy or cloudy, not very good. So with two, it's a little bit better. And then this way you can make the brushes work a little bit faster. Um, if we turn fixation on, uh, uh, doesn't really get that much faster because it still has to just pull all that stuff. And again, um, because we work with the opacity here, it's a really tricky shape. So there's a lot of math that has to go on at the same time. And even in Photoshop, if you make a brush really high, 800 points or something like this in such a large document, it can make your computer crawl. So it's a common problem. Okay, I think this is pretty much covering everything about how to create different brushes. And to export it, you later can click on the gear and then you can click export brushes or import brushes. Uh, if somebody shares a brush, you can also export a complete category. So here, let's click on export brush and there it asks you the current brush or the complete category or even all brushes. So if you just want to share with somebody just individual brush, uh, that's the way then how you can do it. To bring this module to an end, I would like to point you to some helpers. What you see here is actually a Photoshop file that was created in Illustrator and I have kind of like a one centimeter grid system. This is very helpful when for example you want to sketch something and you need maybe a more um, a grid as a helper so that for example if you make variations they are more precise uh, or similar in size. But this can also be very helpful when in Illustrator then we define for example different point sizes. Now this can work in addition to what we did with the different tools because the Kugelschreiber and Tess etc. they are very specific just to the individual tool. But let's say at one point I really want to draw something that has a specific size. And then if inside my document I have for example this representation. Now I see here, I mean, let's say this is something, how does this relate? Well, this is actually too wide. So then I can actually adjust maybe the size and try to get something that looks close to the one millimeter, which seems to be kind of like a six. Because this is like the, I don't know what measurement is being used here for the size. Um, and then the numbers here, 1.75, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.1, actually relate to the size of, of actual pens. So this is a one millimeter pen or a 0.1 millimeter pen. And this way, when you when you sketch digitally and later you print it out, the, the sizes will print exactly the way how you want. So this is actually quite useful. Let's close this. 
let's talk a little bit about colors. So I have here one document and I made some screenshots and composed, for example, all the design colors for Copic in Sketchbook Pro. And I also made myself a copy of, for example, the full color set. I mentioned before that it's very helpful to, to have these colors, but when we do a rendering, most times we pick one or two, three colors, and then that's it, and some gray tones. So it's not really necessary to see all these colors all the time. So I could rather go, let's say, I know I will maybe work with blue 04. Okay, so I, I drop the color, then I go to my sketch, and I have actually a very simple brush that has no texture or anything. And put the color swap down. Okay, and I go back to there. Maybe sample, I don't know, maybe, I just take this color just randomly. Okay, then I go back to my original document, put this color down, and let's say one last color here, this yellow there, and yellow. So, and when I'm inside my, my document here and I start sketching and I want to switch between different colors, then I can simply eye drop actually the, the colors directly from my page so I don't have to go to a palette, open it, select something and then close it and continue drawing. I find this is what is very low tech. It's actually very, very fast. And this is to a certain degree similar to the, is it the mixer? Yeah, the mixer palette here no, where you would mix, for example, your different oil things. So I could even see if maybe I put this one down there and then I sample this one and put it down, sample this one and put it down. So I could keep it inside the mixer and not on my page. No, it's, it's another way um, how to do this and you can just put your, your different tones to there. But if you don't necessarily always want to go this way and this way and this way and this way, there's another very interesting feature. You go to view and then there is reference. And in reference, it was quite, quite amazing. You can load whatever other document you currently have open besides the one obviously that you work in. And then with the hand tool, inside the main document you can move, but also inside the view you can move. And with the zoom also inside the reference we can zoom. And let's say I will at one point maybe work a lot with the grayscale tones. And there. Now I have all my different grayscale tones cropped inside this image here. And then when I start sketching, let's go to the sketching tool there. Let's go to eyedropper, maybe neutral six. There's neutral six or neutral uh, toner two, toner eight or toner four. And you see this works actually very, very easy. I can also close it so it doesn't occupy much space. So that's the reason why um, I don't really work much with the, the color swatch. Unfortunately, currently the color swatch, you can customize some of these colors, but you don't really have a way to export the, the swatch. And pretty much with the reference or the color mixer, it's the same. We just sampled a few colors we only want to work with, and then we can eye drop the colors we need all the time from it.